Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Your Legislators, a production of KRWG Broadcasting. Your Legislators is a public service program providing our viewing audience in southern New Mexico the opportunity to hear about important legislative issues directly from their elected representatives in Santa Fe. I'm Glenn Cerny and we are literally days away from the start of the uh, 2016 legislative session in uh, Santa Fe and, and I'm, I'm pleased to have as our first guest this year uh, Senator John Arthur Smith from uh, Deming and, and, and I, I need to tip you off this is the 10th year we've been doing your legislators and I, I, I think you and I have probably done at least eight of these at eight some of those. point. <laughs> but uh, uh, welcome. Well appreciate being here. Um, as we have done as a tradition now, um, can you just kind of give us a, a, an idea of your, your district? Well, my district uh, in, includes uh, Hidalgo County, which is Lordsburg and Animus and Verdon, uh, Deming and Columbus and Luna County there. And we've got the west side of Las Cruces, uh, includes, including the prison uh, on there, and it uh, goes up to Rhodey. And uh, then I have Sierra County, TRC, Williamsburg, Elephant Butte, uh, Hillsboro, uh, and all that area. Now, now that, that, that's the official district. That's the official but district. But since you serve on the, as chairman of the Legislative Finance Committee and, and on the transportation infrastructure, you have a much larger statewide view of activities to offer. Well, we, we hopefully uh, always keep that uh, in mind. Uh, we have to have a balanced budget. Lynn, and it's, uh, you know, I've approached my political career on the basis and it's been controversial from time to time, but with the resources we've had, I've tried to be as fair as I know how with what we have available. And if a uh, hard time happens to be up on us financially, uh, then I think everybody should share in the pain. And if uh, good times prevail, uh, then I think every New Mexican should be able to participate. And that's been the fundamental formula for John Arthur Smith. Well, and, and, and you, you mentioned the budget, and, and being the short session, the budget is the primary activity. So l l let's get started with that. Um, are, are you comfortable? The Legislative Finance Committee has had more than one hearing across the state to uh, kind of get an idea of, of where we are, and can you just kind of provide an overview of where you think uh, we are as a state going into the session? You know, up until this year, I. I uh, empirically could probably quantify exactly where we're at. This year it's a little bit more difficult with the precarious uh, situation of oil prices uh, and uh, the global market uh, with what's happening there with the, uh, with the price of oil. Uh, natural gas also, uh, natural gas is anemic, uh, but we've known that for quite a while. There's such a tremendous surplus of it that it's getting a little bump in price right now due to the cold weather and the uh, uh, in the country, but uh, that's going to recede, uh, and it looks what, like that we're probably going to have low oil and gas prices uh, a little bit longer than what any of us had wished for uh, on that. Except now, when we fill up at the gas pump. You know, and, and that's where I have a difficult time really complaining because of the prices, because the, the beneficiary of low gasoline prices are the traveling public. Uh, but their additional disposable income that uh, they have doesn't offset the oil and gas, natural gas prices uh, that uh, have benefited the state financially for many years. It, it, it all comes down to projections. I mean, you're, you're really playing a, a guessing game as, as you go through the budgeting process here. What are those levels going to be? Where is taxation going to be? And, and, and right now, you and I were chatting, oil is somewhere between 35 and $37 a barrel. Uh, that, that's uh, correct, and, and that's the, the West Texas, but with our transportation cost, uh, we're probably 2 to $3 less than that, and our budget forecast was set at around $49. Uh, on that, you know, I've uh, we we have a consensus revenue forecast. Can can you explain that the, process? Uh, well, it's made up of uh, three executive branch members. Uh, Department of Transportation has an economist, Tax and Revenue 
department has an economist and department of finance has an economist and they all uh, have to answer to the executive branch. The legislative finance committee has an economist and they're on it. So you have uh, four members on that consensus revenue forecast. And up until about six or seven years ago, uh, that was perceived, whatever they came up uh, with as far as the estimates on the consensus was the gospel. And uh, s former Senator Tim Jennings and myself challenged the gospel uh, here under the prior administration. Uh, as it turned out that uh, we had better information with what was happening to the economy than the administration did uh, in about 2009-2010 timeframe uh, on that. and. Uh, Tim is uh, no longer in the legislature, and this last August, uh, when the first forecast came out from the consensus of revenue forecasters, it was estimated that we would have $293 million of new money based on about a $6.2, $6.3 billion general fund budget. And I challenged it at that time. We had the meeting up in Taos and said I, I really didn't believe it. Uh, number one, in fairness to the DFA, they're looking we're having to look too far down the road. When we're setting our budget right now that we will be passing here in January and first part of February, we don't anticipate revenues being delivered until starting July because that's when that budget kicks in. So last August we were actually looking about 17, 18 months down the road trying to guess what our revenue stream was going to be. But I challenged it at the time and then in the first part of December, we came in for a new revenue forecast. Uh, that forecast was lowered by another 62 million, so it's down around uh, 232 million uh, right now is new money. Uh, at that time, uh, the Secretary of DFA and I had an exchange. Uh, it was a polite exchange, but he didn't want us to be so bearish, and I didn't want him to be so bullish so I suspect between the, the two of us probably lies the true, but the bottom line is the $232 million that uh, we will be trying to build a budget from is, is somewhat precarious. So you could see some additional adjustments being made here probably the end of January. Uh, in the legislative finance budget, what we did, we built it on $232 million new dollars but we put about 77 million in a contingency that if the revenues materialize, then we will move forward with that contingency. And if the reserves hit a certain level, then we will move forward. But in the event they don't materialize, then we're gonna have to do some additional trimming. Uh, now, I don't want the public to take it wrong right now because you often hear the words cut, 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 cut. We're not cutting at this stage unless price of oil drops from $37 <coughs> down to about $20, and we'll, that will be a completely different environment for us. But at this stage, we will have maybe 2% uh, uh, growth in revenues uh, to bill from. And so with that, we'll be moving ahead. The Legislative Finance Committee, which I chair this time and I guess next time, and then it's taken over by the chairman of the, the House Appropriation, typically, uh, on that or their vice chair, uh, which in this case is the uh, Republican Party on the House side. Mm -hmm. But in the Legislative Finance Committee where we all come together, the legislature as an entire body <coughs> has a, a somewhat of a, uh, uh, a consensus, uh, not an agreement to start out with any certain number, but a consensus that we have real concerns about the reliability of our revenue stream. And, uh, and we have been somewhat out of step with the executive branch on that. The executive branch agencies were still submitting budgets to us in December built on 292, 293 million of new money. Uh, they had not even at that point in time recognized the uh, decrease to 232 million. So uh, those, those budgets are gonna have to be re reworked. Uh, We've always kept high reserves because of the volatility of oil and gas. Uh, oftentimes people challenge us saying your percentage of reserves are twice what most states have. 
but we are so reliant on oil and gas that, uh, that it's prudent to say, hey, we better have a, a, a safety factor that other states don't have. R uh, quite frankly, uh, states that are really suffering probably even more than, than New Mexico now, the state of Alaska uh, ha has a huge problem. Uh, Wyoming has uh, a problem uh, that, that's taking place. And that's adjusted drastically in just the last five years. That's right. And, and uh, North Dakota is having a diff difficult time. And I think Oklahoma is now trying to close about a $900 million, a $600 to $900 million general fund gap uh, in, in Oklahoma, uh, which points to the need that I'm not trying to get rid of oil and gas, I'm not trying to get rid of defense spending, but it reflects that this state needs to move in a direction that gives us a more reliable, stable revenue stream if we're gonna fund state government in a stabilized manner, uh, i.e., for example, education, public ed and higher ed take about 60% of every t t revenue that we have uh, for their budget, about 45 for public ed and about 15 for higher ed. So uh, if you want to flatten out the hills and valleys that oil and gas bring, uh, you better have a broader economy. And so that's the challenge for uh, this legislature and future legislative members. I, I want to kind of come back to it, but I, I want to interject something in here. That, that w One of the issues that, that uh, appeared to develop um, during the last session, it was the first time that the Republicans had control of the House, and, and, and I, I, I think the, perhaps the nicest way I heard it put was there was just some confusion on how to organize and move forward in, in a uh, proper manner. Has that started to resolve itself? What, what do you think the situation is between the House and the Senate right now? Well, the, the, the Senate has, has always been a different body, and the, for the last 10 or 12 years, the Senate has been very, very independent. Uh, the Senate has challenged the executive, even if they're a Democrat governor, uh, and, uh, and they've challenged the uh, executive when they're a Republican governor. Uh, the, the House, uh, under brand new leadership, is still trying to sort of find their way. Uh, and I'm not trying to be demeaning, but it's a learning experience. You know, when you're the minority party, uh, you don't have to be responsible. Uh, when you're the majority party, you have to be responsible when it comes to budget items. And for many, many years, the uh, minority party on the House side didn't have to take the leadership, but you could throw rocks at what, what was being done. Well, the shoe is on the other foot now, and they are the party of responsibility, they have to be the party of responsibility on the House side, and uh, the minority party can throw those rocks now uh, on that. But uh, with that being said, hopefully uh, the House will uh, have learned a lot from the, the last session that we were in. Uh, this will be their first 30-day session uh, that they've had to lead in. We had uh, uh, major disagreement over capital outlay uh, and some funding issues on roads and that sort of thing that put us back into special session. But the, uh, and that was attributed to some, some of the changes that the, that the House made. And we reversed those changes and they came on board uh, during the special session and, and concurred with what the Senate had done originally. And I want to bring up that 2016 being an election year and a year from now we well, may be <laughs> looking right. at a whole different, let's not even go that, right. go that way. But, but my reason for bringing it up is looking at appropriations and, and your committee with legislative finance, are you finding areas that there is good agreement so that this budget could be put together? I don't, I don't want to say easily, but it, it, with, with some sense of finality in the 30 days. You know, the, the vice chair of legislative finance committee is Representative Jim Hall, and then uh, chairman of the House Appropriation is Larry Larinaga. And, and we have agreement uh, in the sense between the House and the Senate that we question the reliability of our revenues. We're on common ground. Uh, we have strong suspicion that the 232 million may be far too aggressive uh, on that. And that puts both parties somewhat at odds with the executive branch. When I say both parties, I'm talking about the appropriating and the finance committees uh, on that. But once again, you have to have a balanced budget both of those are committees are the ones that finally have to say no, 
and I can attest to the fact that when you say no, it doesn't make you popular, but you still have to be responsible. You, you've, you've heard those comments, I, have I've you? I've heard those comments, uh, <laughs> we, right. I was uh, kid about right being <laughs> senator, I knew, no. <laughs> I, I knew they were talking about somebody else, though. Uh, <laughs> certainly not me. Well, okay, so, so we, we, we've got some grounds for optimism between the House and the Senate, but there's the third leg of this stool, and, and that's the governor's office, and, and she'll be making her announcements here very early when the session opens, and are, are you anticipating anything out of the blue there? If the uh, revenues stay about where they're at, when I talk about oil and gas revenues, you know, there was a a statement made by the executive branch that the uh, gross receipts tax were up and the corporate taxes were up. They haven't been up. We're down about 10% on those other categories versus last year what was happening. So I, I do believe that there will be a modification of the executive branch budget uh, on that. And that budget I think will probably be out uh, possibly the, the first part of next week or supposed to be, it may, maybe even on Friday of this week. Prior to the session. It's prior to the session. Uh, but I think you're going to see a, a, a more uh, careful uh, approach to the budget process than the advertised originally of 232 million new dollars, 292 million new dollars. I, I think they're going to proceed a little bit more cautiously uh, with what they're forecasting. So. The challenge is going to be trying to put something together and hope like the devil that, that, uh, that those revenues materialize. You, you've got a running start here, but even, even with that running start and all the meetings that have been going on all, all summer and even at the end of the session, um, but there's other things that will come up. The budget is priority number one, but the, the governor can also kind of set the stage for some other things to be taken into consideration. Is there a short list of what that might be that you'll be looking at during the session? Well, the, the governor's already, already uh, indicated there's certain areas. Uh, obviously, driver's license will be on that issue. Uh, I think uh, stricter DWI laws will be on that issue, uh, uh, on the message that's issued by the governor to allow those uh, categories to be placed into the 30-day session. Um, and there's additional initiatives out there that uh, may open the door uh, once DWI door is open and once the uh, stiffer penalties or, or that door is open, uh, then I think you're going to see other peripheral uh, issues surfacing. But once again, it's 30-day session. Uh, constitutionally and responsibly, uh, it's the budget. Uh, I only sit on one committee. I'm getting calls about other issues on uh, payday lending. Uh, I don't even sit on those committees. Uh, that'll be a Judiciary Committee hearing, and that'll be a, a probably a corporation or public affairs and, hearing. And the issue there is how right. high the, uh, the rates are. Rates can be, right. and, and that they roll over, and essentially a $1,000 loan right. can turn in quickly into a $10,000 loan. loan. And then uh, ethics is going to be a huge issue. Well, and especially uh, with the developments, with, with uh, uh, what, what happened uh, up there with uh, um, Duran and everything. But, but I, I mean, this has been a pretty regular discussion as well. Is there going to be movement? Is there a sense that, look, we've got to get a little more serious about this? Well, you know, I, 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 I listen to the rhetoric that it really doesn't uh, nothing's been done by the legislature. Uh, we had an incident in the Senate with a Senate member. Uh, you know, I, I guess from the public standpoint, they would like to have more information, but the senator resigned. So it became a moot question. And not only did what it was a moot question, but it saved this taxpayer a lot of money. But people often say, well, the system's not even working. Well, it worked in that case. It worked in that case. Uh, I think on the Secretary of State's side, uh, the system probably worked. They were caught. Uh, they went to trial and, and they're having to pay a penalty for it on that. So the system is, is working there. Uh, but you often hear the outcry that we need to turn this over to an independent third party to make that determination. And once again, that legislation is going to have to go through various committees and 
will not be going through the Finance Committee, and so I don't know exactly what's going to be coming out uh, in the way of legislation from that standpoint. Uh, you have uh, Senator Worth that's talking on campaign reform. Uh, you've got Senator Rue that's on capital outlay that uh, wants it all to be disclosed, and if an agency, a news agency, wants that information, that information is pretty much disclosed right now. Uh, you can uh, turn to the local governments here and find out what John Arthur Smith dedicated to this project. Uh, that information is available uh, on that. So I don't know how far that initiative is, is going. My, my concern with the capital outlay issue is I want the efficient use of the dollars. I want them to be put to work right now. Uh, we have a process on GO bonds, general obligation bonds, where typically the initiatives that are funded out of that are higher education, uh, senior citizen area on aging, uh, museums and libraries are funded on that. Well, the process for higher education, they go through a, a screening process. Secretary of Higher Education ultimately will have the final say after meeting with higher education and they prioritize the projects that they have. And in uh, area on aging, typically up until last year was pretty good until they front end loaded all projects north of, of I-40 and virtually none south of I-40 and that was corrected on the Senate side in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, with Republicans and Democrats pulling together in the Finance Committee and said it's going to be that, it's going to be uh, at least speeded out more fairly. Well, and another issue that, that came up in the last several years, and it's a little odd to talk about this was as much snow and the fact that it's raining right now, but water use in the, in the state and, and plans for the future with water are, are involved with capital outlay. Uh, you know, we've, uh, specifically, I, I can't cite uh, exactly where we're at, but last year was the year of water. New Mexico nationally ranks extremely high, like in the top five or ten states, dedicating money to water resources uh, on that. And it's a, it's a huge number, but water debate and discussion is much more intense, and intense when it's, there's a drought. And when there's not a drought, people sort of forget, let's move on to the next project. But, but water needs a long-term plan. Our state water law is, is envied by a lot of surrounding states because our fathers in the legislature and governors in the legislature came up with some of the earlier toughest water law in the country uh, on that, and we're still known for that. Uh, we uh, would like to encourage Texas to uh, participate. I mean, they want to certainly monitor on whether our usage of it but in the state of Texas, they don't even monitor their wells uh, on, on that. And uh, it's, it's sort of challenging when they're pointing a finger at you when, on the other hand, they've got a huge hole in the dike uh, on that. Well, and it's a little tough to get Austin to talk about a lack of water when it's been flooded three times in the last year, that, that, too. That, that's right, that's <laughs> right. Uh, it, we mentioned the transportation I infrastructure. Uh, the federal government has provided some funding for roads and infrastructure. How does that dovetail on what might be done with New Mexico roads in, in this session? And I know that's one of your favorite topics. Well, uh, you, you know, that was a sort of a subcommittee uh, under the uh, Revenue Stabilization Committee, and I argued about not even having that committee because the executive branch has been in opposition to expanded revenues for the uh, oil and gas we're talking about, uh, gasoline prices uh, on that. And I said, I really didn't see that going anywhere unless you had buy-in by the executive branch uh, on that. Uh, I argued so uh, ferociously, let's say, that I became chairman of that committee. <laughs> I wasn't <laughs> able to get rid of that committee. But uh, with that being said, let me give you a, a, an idea of where New Mexico stands. We talk about state roads. We have a huge problem with local roads. Uh, our gasoline tax is... You, you, you drove through Las Cruces to get to the studio. <laughs> that, that's right, that's right. But it's 17 to 18 cents, 18 cents uh, is our gasoline tax. Uh, the, we're in the lower third on gasoline tax. 
Utah, which is probably the finest managed state in the West, uh, by far, is it went with the last Olympics, they went from 17, 18 cents to 24 cents, and as of January 1st, they've gone to a floor of 29 cents a gallon. But our road issues far exceed what a gasoline tax will fix because we have greater utilization with vehicles, but much more efficient mileage wise. And so the money really hasn't increased uh, as far as fixing the roads. The uh, Bottom line is in 1995, thereabouts, is when we took a gasoline tax increase and then rolled it back under Governor Johnson. That dollar in gasoline tax now has the buying power of about 54 cents. Uh, what we've done over the years, and Las Cruces benefited from some of that, but we've bonded roads, we've borrowed money, and we've borrowed against the federal money to pay those bonds off. New Mexico is now servicing 140 million a year in debt, credit card debt, uh, mind you, that could have been going on the roads, but we're paying for a road to Farmington still, we're paying for the big eye in Albuquerque, and we're paying for some of the interstate work here in Doniana County. Uh, that 140 million would go a long way toward paving and fixing and repairing a lot of state roads. You certainly have work cut out for you for the f four weeks coming up in Santa Fe and uh, Santa Fe. Again, thank you so much for taking the time. You've always been a good friend of uh, your legislators thank and you. uh, remind you that uh, if you want to keep up to date on what's going on in Santa Fe during the session, be sure to tune in to Morning Edition and All Things Considered on KRWG-FM during the session as well. I'm Glenn Cerny and thank you for watching.